منعون بي السجن منعون بي اللي حدد بوابه محروم شم الهوى يا بوي محروم شم الهوى يا بوي ومفارق حبابه وقل يا جنابي من بلاط السجن قضين يا عالم قضين وقل يا سناني من ميت الساطل صدين يا عالم صدين قولوا لمي وخواتي حدين ترى الموت والسجن سوا يا بيا بيا يا أمي بعد اعتقاله وهو معصوب العينين ومقيد البدن وقالت منظمة بتسليم بالتيلم الحقوقية الإسرائيلية قالت هذه المنظمة إن الحادثة وقعت قبل أسبوعين أثناء احتجاج على الجدار العازل في قرية نعلين في محافظة رام الله وأوضحت أن الشاب لم يكن مسلحا عند اعتقاله من قبل مجموعة من الجنود الإسرائيليين Israeli soldiers deliberately breaking the bones of prisoners. Some of the soldiers later insisted they were carrying out official Israeli policy. operations, search operations, going into taking over cities or towns or villages, uh, of course in the night time, and uh, sometimes you would continue in the same place for a few days, searching, going one house to the other, searching them, 
taking over houses as observation points or uh, arresting people. And that's your routine. My routine was, or our routine, was that we never knew where we're going to be from one minute to the other. One night we could be in Nablus, the next night we could be in Gaza, the next night we could be in Hebron. And at a, there's, at a certain point you just lose track of where you are, who you are, and, and what you're doing because you go into, you disrupt people's lives on a daily basis. And for me that was the most, um, I think when I look at it today, when I reflect on it today as someone who couldn't do that during your service, because you can't really, you live in a, you know, a denial uh, way of life where you can't look at what you're doing, you can't really reflect on it. But when I reflect on it today from, from this perspective, I can say that that was probably for me the, the deepest uh, example of corruption. Not the extreme cases where there was shooting or stuff like that, but just thinking that there were hundreds of thousands of, of families that couldn't have one peaceful night of sleep in their homes. I mean, who, of, who in, in today, in, in the USA, in Israel, and anywhere else, would be willing to live like that? Not knowing if at 2 o'clock in the morning, 20 soldiers will take over your house for a week. Not knowing, sitting in your, in your living room and suddenly hearing... Uh, uh, smashing on the wall and and there is a hole in the wall and suddenly 20 soldiers come to visit and um, and for me that was routine in the newspaper I saw uh, just uh, an article about the conf conf confiscation car keys confiscation um, when you detain car uh, during to, to enforce curfew when you detain cars because they just passed the line that um, close to the checkpoint, whatever. And it's not the article and the soldier that brought out uh, more or less 100 uh, car keys and brought it, brought it to the press, but the, the response of the spokesman, sir, of the IDF, the spokesman of the IDF that said, um, this is an extreme case, a rotten apple, it will be checked, uh, examined, and won't happen again. And now I gave the order to take Palestinian car keys and to detain cars hundreds of times in my unit. I saw in the West Bank boxes full of car keys and, and IDs that were taken and were supposed to be returned. But And then I know my father read the newspaper before me and I know that he believed. I mean, he's from, the, from a different generation where things maybe were better or when people could believe the system. And he really thinks that this is an extreme case that would wouldn't be that won't happen again. And for me, that was it was a point a point of understanding that I'm not back for what I did. And I didn't do it for fun. I got my orders. I thought it was okay. I thought I was a part of a <coughs> system that protect Israel from terror attacks. And and then I understand that it's you know it's just a game. Of keeping information inside and not letting anybody know, and how can you criticize? How can you ask questions? And that was maybe one of the first times that I asked what's going on here.